Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us. I see that Yane has some fans in the chat. Lots of hellos. Um, so hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. As you probably know, my name is Mara Walsh and I will be your host today. I'm excited to be back and hosting this virtual tour. We don't have them frequently as we did during COVID, so it's always good to be online with everybody again. And even better to be here with an old friend who's done other virtual tours with us in the past few years. Before we get started our, um, on this virtual tour presentation today, I wanna go over a few housekeeping items. Please know that you are on Zoom webinar. Your video and your microphone are not activated, so you will not be seen or heard, but we do wanna hear from you. So you can uh, chat with me in the chat. And if you want to leave a question that Yone will answer after the video presentation, please leave that in the Q&A. If you're having audio or visual or video issues, just drop a note to me in the chat and I'll help you through that after the introduction. Um, I always tell you where I'm located because I think it's important for the time zone. I'm located between Philadelphia and New York in the United States, which is the Eastern time zone. You can use New York as your time zone. So if you're trying to um, figure out what time the virtual tour series starts, when I say 5 p.m. Eastern time, that's 5 p.m. New York time, which is what it is right now. As you may know by now, when we're not traveling virtually, I host groups on physical tours as well as help others plan their own family and group vacations. My tours are mainly adult only and open to all uh, women and men. And my summer trips are for ages teens through seniors. So we have multi-age tours in the summer. If you wanna follow our physical tours, please join my Facebook group, which is Girl Travel Tours. We are um, always um, posting during our travel and we have two trips coming up, one in November and one in December. Both of them are to Cuba. We have a full schedule of trips in 2024. So if you want to join us virtually or if you wanna join us physically, um, you can check them out on my website and um, on my Facebook group. As you may be aware, I started traveling with my tour director friends virtually when COVID struck and we were unable to travel physically. These virtual tour presentations have helped many tour directors earn some much needed income during those years when they were not traveling, but they are traveling and they are in full swing now. So we have to make sure that they keep that, that going for us and um, hopefully for all of you who are able to travel. But we are still trying to put a lot of virtual tours on our calendar when the tour directors are available and as well as um, some tour directors that are not able to guide at this moment for one reason or another. We've done more than 80 virtual tours and the recordings are all available on girltraveltours.com as well as on my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. So if you've missed them, which I'm sure you happen, ha, have had to miss at least a couple, you can go back at your leisure and watch them at any time. Um, we do have a few virtual tours on the calendar for the end of this year. Let me share that for you so that you see. Um, we're going to do Alexander Palace um, in a week. We're going to Kiev next month. We're doing Jews in Russia. And we're also going back to Spain and doing Toledo and La Mancha. So I hope you will join us for those. And as I get more um, information, I always put it up on, on my, um, my website as well as Facebook. If you always want to make sure that you're alerted, just go to my website, girltraveltours.com. There's a little um, newsletter inclusion. So if you put your email in there, you'll get a newsletter email that's, uh, that's sent to you and it will update you on the virtual tours that are coming up. Okay, let's get into it and review a few of the interactive um, ways that we're gonna interact on, on this session. We have um, the Zoom Q&A. You're going to leave your questions for Yone in there. The Zoom chat is for you to send any pieces of information you'd like to for me. And then we do have a poll, which I'd like to put up because it's always good to get a basis uh, for what your connection is with this region. So we're talking about Central Italy, and we're going to find out if you have been there and loved it, 
I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I have no set plans, but I'm interested in the region, or I am solely here to experience it virtually. I'm going to give you a second to answer that question, and then I'm going to share it with you. I know Yane, who is our tour director here today, she is very interested in this, I'm sure, um, because it is her home region. So she's very proud of it and wants to share it with us. I'm going to end that poll. It's interesting because it looks like so many people have been to this area of Italy, which you might still discover that there's a lot of Italy in this presentation that you've never been to, that you're going to get today. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is obviously a huge interest in this region and that's why people are here. So I'm gonna stop sharing that at this point. And um, this leads us into, um, I've already mentioned Yone several times as, as I've gotten into this, but uh, our tour presentation today is about 60 minutes, give or take, with a Q&A at the end. So we'll be running past the hour. Um, as you know, a tour wouldn't be complete without a fantastic tour director. And today we have back Yone, who um, will bring her home region to us. So Yone, if you want to join me now, I can hand over the screen to you and you can share your screen. Thank you so much for being here with us. I know you have a very, very full tour schedule as Italy is probably one of the two top regions in Europe that has been visited this year. From what I understand, Italy and Greece are at the top. And it is just amazing how many people you can fit in that country, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to hand it over to you. And if you're ready, you can take it from here. Hello, can you hear me? Ciao. <laughs> hello, everybody. And hello, special hello to all my friends that have come to join me. You're not yet tired of touring with me. You come again, and I'm so honored. And hello to everyone else. As Mara said, I am very pleased and very proud to lead this tour in Central Italy because uh, it's where I live and where I grew up. So uh, for the ones that don't know me, uh, my name is Yone, and uh, I live in this wonderful place uh, uh, that we call Tusha. Uh, it's a place that we call, we call the Tusha and I call home because this is exactly where I am now. I'm a tour director. I've been a tour director for almost 12 years and I lead tours all over Europe. But I can tell you that I have never led a tour here. So this is quite special. Uh, I've called this tour Hidden Gems of Central Italy because the places I've been, I will introduce to you are, I'm pretty sure, unknown to the most of the visitors that love spending their vacations in, in Italy. First question that arises uh, is why? Hold on, because my, ah, okay, there we go. So if you take a look at the map, uh, if we locate the Tusha area on the Italian map, you will see that where you see the circle, this is where the Tusha is. It, it, it is. It's caught in between two very famous tourist destinations, Rome on one side and Tuscany on the other side. Rome is about 90 miles away towards the south. Meanwhile, cities such as Firenze, Siena, Pisa, the beautiful Chianti regions are located about two hours driving north. Therefore, people tend to visit these very well-known and also well-promoted regions, missing sometimes what's in between. And after the years of the pandemic, we are finally all back to, to travel, to work in my case. Um, but despite the excitement of being able to be on the road again, we do realize that most of the iconic places where we want to go to are getting extremely, extremely crowded, uh, such as 
Florence, for instance, <laughs> sometimes people, uh, they get really disappointed when realizing that thousands of other people uh, are in these cities uh, and their experience there is undoubtedly also impacted uh, by having to survive all these crowds and queues and so on. There is a huge debate nowadays in many European countries about the so-called over-tourism. So La Tuscia stands then uh, as a very interesting solution for all those travelers that want to continue to visit the eternal city of Rome or the highlights of Tuscany, but with a more relaxed itinerary away from the crowds, uh, discovering also precious cultural and artistic heritage. As you probably hear, the sound of the name Tuscia is very similar to Tuscany. The city where I live is called Tuscania, and every time I say to somebody that I'm from Tuscania, they all tell me, ah, oh, Tuscany, I love it, of course I've been there. And I go like, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> because as, since I live here, I know that we don't have so many tourists. Um, so let's clarify first that Tuscany and Tusha are two different things, uh, although they are neighbors. So of course they have a lot in common. So Tusha is the area with a very ancient history and the heart of central Italy, encompassing roughly the province of Viterbo, the upper part of the region of Lazio. Tusha is the ancient land of the Etruscans, whose traces are still clearly visible in the many archaeological sites that dot its territory. But because of its strategic location on the Tyrrhenian coast and a stone throw from Rome, it has been for centuries an important crossroads for, that has seen the passages of kings, princes, aristocrats, and so on, bringing with them great architects and artists who have created the really authentic masterpieces. Uh, an important feature of the cities in this area is that the shape of the city is so visible in the ancient times it is still traceable today. This is largely due because uh, of not having built uh, over in later periods, uh, whether in medieval or modern times. So Tusha is a corner of Italy that has, needs to be discovered at a very slow pace. The term Tusha derives from the Latin word Tusha, the territory which was once inhabited by the Tushi. And the Tushi is the Latin name given to the Etruscans, Etruschi in Italian. Etruria was the name given to the area which was made the seventh region of Italy under the Roman Emperor Augustus. So the early origins date to the end of the Bronze Age. The name Tuscia nowadays is referred mainly to the province of Viterbo, La Tuscia Viterbese, we call it. And today we will explore uh, some of the most uh, precious and secret sites of it. Before us, uh, some other illustrious uh, uh, scholars and travelers uh, have wondered at the amazing beauty of these places. And I, I would like to quote one of them, uh, D.H. Lawrence, uh, who wrote this amazing travel book, uh, was published posthumously in 1932, about uh, the Etruscan cities that he had visited during his journey to Italy. Uh, this is a very passionate account uh, of a man who is deeply amazed by uh, such a mysterious and ancient civilization of which also at that time we didn't know much, we, we still don't know much about the Etruscans. And uh, also quite interesting is how he compares the greatness of these people and of this city to the gloomy atmosphere that Italy had uh, at that time when he wrote the book, because it was during the fascist uh, dictatorship of Benito Mussolini. So this is a book I strongly suggest you reading, especially if you have an interest uh, in history and archaeology. So now I hope I have made you curious a little bit of the places I wanted to show you. I just want to mention that all the cities are, I'm, um, 
introducing to you are at about 20, 40 minutes uh, driving distance one from the other, which is quite impressive uh, once you will see uh, the striking sites that we are going to explore. So, andiamo, let's go. Uh, this is the first site. This is where we start. Uh, this is the Bolsena Lake. The lake is a, a volcanic lake. You can see it for its typical oval shape. And this is the largest volcanic lake of Europe. It all started 370,000 years ago when a volcanic explosion throughout Lapilli, Lava, Pozzolana, and emptying the underlying area and the surface crust and sunk, forming a huge caldera. In the course of the tens of thousands of years passing by, the rain filled up this huge crater, creating Lake Bolsena. The volcano was active until 104 BC. The volcanic eruption that gave rise to the lake brought also the soil rich in minerals that characterizes the surrounding slopes. Cultivations such as olive groves, vineyards, legumes alternate with woods of turkey oats and downy oat. Volcanic activity uh, continued and other explosions inside the lake led to the formation of these two marvelous islands that you see in the picture, called Martana and Byzantina. The islands preserve a vast botanical heritage and have a high historical value because of they were chosen as holiday places for various lords, uh, uh, popes, uh, and important people that uh, dominated these lands. This is one of the islands, it's called Byzantina Island, Isola Byzantina. It has got seven oratories, two convents, the convent of St. James and the convent of St. Christopher, and it's beautiful gardens, and it is considered the major tourist attraction of the lake. Uh, it was chosen as a summer residence of the popes in different areas of the history. Then we have another island, which is the Isola Martana, which still preserves uh, the remains of the fortress uh, in which Queen Amalasunta, the, the daughter of King Theoderic of the Goths, was imprisoned in 535 and killed on the orders of her cousin and husband, uh, Theodorat. Both islands, Byzantina and Martana, are now uh, privately owned, but it is possible to visit the islands because quite often private tours are organized. Or something else that people really enjoy doing is uh, renting boats uh, and going sailing around the islands, uh, also to enjoy the beautiful nature. For instance, the islands are particularly um, impressive for bird watching. So um, about a month ago, I think, uh, it was all over the newspapers in Italy that Forbes had chosen Bolsena, the village that gives name to the lake, as one of the 10 Europe's most beautiful small towns. The city was built by the Romans after they had conquered the ancient Etruscan city Velsna, located in what nowadays we call Orvieto, and had transferred its inhabitants to the nearby lake Bolsena. Nowadays, the old town of Bolsena is dating back to the medieval times with the ancient Monaldeschi fortress that you've seen in the video, which is situated on the hill dominating uh, the old village. Bolsena, uh, was also an important stop on the Via Francigena, the pilgrim route that linked Canterbury in England to Rome. Here you see uh, a little picturesque corner of the city. As you see, the town has got many of the charms of Tuscany, but fewer of the crowds. <laughs> it is a, a very well-preserved historical uh, center, uh, but also some impressive churches and palaces. 
During the Renaissance, uh, Bolzina became a favorite uh, of the likes of aristocrats and popes. It, it is characterized by many ancient ruins uh, dating back to Ruskin, um, Roman and medieval times. Uh, and it is a very unique combination of uh, history and tradition. So if you have been to the Vatican Museums in Rome, you probably have seen or you have had the chance of admiring this beautiful fresco painted by Raphael. Uh, the fresco is called the Bolsena Mass, and there is a self-portrait of Raphael himself. If you look on the right corner of the picture, the man facing out is, uh, is Raphael himself. The fresco tells the story of the miracle of Bolsena. Uh, basically in 1263, a Bohemian priest, uh, Peter of Prague, was tormented by the doubt as to whether Christ was actually present in the consecrated host and went on a pilgrimage to Rome to strengthen his faith. On his way back, he stopped in Bolsena and uh, he, was, um, he was serving Mass in the Church of Santa Caterina. And while he was celebrating the Holy Mass above the tomb of Santa Caterina, uh, he had barely spoken the words of the consecration when blood started to seep from the consecrated host and trickle over his hands onto the marble altar and the corporal. The priest interrupted the mass and asked to be taken to Orvieto, the city where Pope Urban IV was residing. The Pope listened to the priest's account and absolved him and ordered the bishop to bring the host and the linen cloth bearing the stains to the blood, of the blood to Orvieto. So the Pope made the procession and had the relics placed in the cathedral. Today, the corporal of Bolzena is still kept in the cathedral of Orvieto, which is another jewel that you can visit uh, in this area. This cathedral is really one of the most beautiful cathedrals we have in Italy. And it is considered a gem of uh, Romanesque and Gothic style. Quite special to have a Gothic cathedral in central Italy, since the Gothic art is much more developed in the north of Italy. Think about the Duomo of Milan, the cathedral in Milan. Anyway, here, not only you can admire this incredible facade, but the inside you will admire some other precious things such as the organ, which is the biggest of Italy with 5,600 5, pipes, together with some incredible frescoes. If you walk inside the cathedral, you can see this beautiful chapel, it's very famous, it's called Chapel of San Brizio, which was painted by two of the most important artists of the Renaissance, Luca Signorelli and Beato Angelico. And here we have another selfie. <laughs> These two men in the, in the picture, in the fresco, are the artists themselves. Luca Signorelli and the monk ne next, to, next to him is uh, uh, the, the priest, Beato Angelico, who's also an artist. And this selfie was painted by Luca Signorelli in honor of himself and his uh, colleague. Another must see in the city of Orvieto is also the St. Patrick Well, which is a, a, a well dating back the Renaissance time. It's a, a masterpiece of engineering. On the way back to our magic lake, uh, we will stop at this uh, beautiful viewpoint where you can see the terrain of the Kalanki or called Badlands in English, where soft tufa rock uh, sits on a fragile and constantly shifting stratum of sand and clay. Here, Maybe some of you have been here or are familiar with this city. Here we see Civita uh, di Bagnoreggio. Uh, here, the unstable terrain has led to the erosions of the years, making whisk egg peaks of the neighboring valley and sending entire portions of the village, which was once a town, into the depths below. Uh, the town is noted for its striking uh, position on top of this volcanic plateau of tufa um, stones uh, overlooking the Tiber River Valley. 
They used to call it Civita, la città che muore, the dying city. Uh, over the centuries, most of the populations moved uh, to Bagnoreggio, the neighboring town, which once uh, was attached to Civita, uh, but it was separated from it in the 18th century after a very violent earthquake. So the two cities are now divided from this canyon. The bridge that links uh, the old town of Civita di Bagnoreggio to the other town was partially destroyed by fleeing Nazis during World War II, and the villagers were had started to leave. In the 1960s, a new bridge was built, uh, the one that you see now in the picture, but people uh, were living in the town in an extreme state of poverty, so the council ordered them out. Uh, by the 1960s, more or less, the, the village was practically abandoned. Uh, the, something like eight or nine people were still living there. I do remember going there as a little girl with my family, and it really looked pretty scary back then because it really looked like a ghost town. There was really literally nobody. Uh, then uh, something something extraordinary has happened, uh, and in this case, that was tourism, because thanks to tourism, uh, uh, Civita di Bagnoreggio, the dying city, came back to life uh, uh, to the point that in 2018, uh, they registered one million visitors from all over the world. Uh, very interesting in Civita di Bagnoreggio is the museum, the Geological and Landslides Museum. It's really worth visiting because it uh, explains uh, the geology of the area, which is so special and which makes this area so so special. They they have interactive rooms uh, where they narrate uh, all the story of the erosion, the landslides, uh, uh, and the materials this, that shape this beautiful. Um, this beautiful province. Now, on the way back to Bolzena, between uh, Bolzena and Monte Fiascone, we also have a, a Commonwealth War Cemetery from World War II. There are about 600 graves, 600 burial sites of uh, soldiers, uh, and the majority of the soldiers uh, buried here uh, are South Africans. Driving up the hills around the lake, you will arrive in Montefiascone, the highest village around the lake, where you can enjoy breathtaking views like this. The city is also very famous for the production of white wine uh, with a very funny name. It's called Est, Est, Est. The legend states that a bishop traveling to Rome would send a scout ahead of him to try out the best wines of the area, and this person had to mark them with the word est. If the wine was good, he would have written on the on the on the doorway of the winemaker est, which in, in Latin means it is or that's it. Uh, the wine in Montefiascone was so good that uh, the scout marked uh, Est, 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 an explosion of, uh, of happiness of, uh, of this man. And so therefore we still call the wine Est, Est, Est. Now, here by nearby Montefiascone, we have this other very small but beautiful village of uh, Marta. We play the video. Um, Marta is, uh, has got a very charming uh, architecture, uh, but besides uh, the picturesque characteristic village, which includes also a smaller fisherman village around the shores of the lake, uh, Marta is quite special because here you can attend some folkloristic events uh, that uh, take place uh, since uh, a remote uh, age. The most famous one here is the uh, Barabata. So um, every 14th of May, uh, they celebrate this very special festivity, uh, fe festival of La Madonna del Monte, which we also called Barabata. Uh, hundreds of visitors attend this festival and they celebrate the ancient popular vernal rites of offerings to Mother Earth. Um, so the 
it, it's a very strange, uh, you know, um, festivity because uh, sacred and profane peacefully coexist because the, the festival has got pagan's origins, but it has been reabsorbed somehow in the Catholic uh, tradition. Uh, basically, the festival celebrates uh, farming, agriculture, fishing, uh, all the activities that are predominant in this area. Um, they, they start very early uh, in the morning at 4 a.m. They go fishing with the boats, they come back and they make all these beautiful charts uh, uh, displaying all the products of the, of the earth. So you will find fruit, vegetables, cheeses, fish and so on. And also they share it with the visitors. Uh, you walk around the charts and somebody offers you a glass of wine or a slice of cheese, uh, like that. So not only the fragrances, the colors, uh, the beautifulness of this, uh, of this event, but also what is quite impressive and I would say quite rare to find nowadays is this spontaneous uh, and strong uh, uh, community feeling that bonds the inhabitants of Marta because literally everybody participates to this parade, uh, all the people, children, men and women, they are all dressed up in the traditional costumes, uh, sharing the joy and the pride uh, of being Martani. Uh, uh, every now and then they will take out their he hats and shout, Viva Maria! Viva la Madonna del Monte! You know, it's very, uh, especially if you come from abroad, I think you would really appreciate uh, uh, something like that. On the way from Marta, now we are heading towards the, the main city, Viterbo. On the way from Marta to Viterbo, if you want to feel like a real aristocrat, Roman aristocrats, you can relax in this incredible natural area called Bagnaccio. Viterbo's hot springs uh, were already known to the ancient Romans who built here marvelous spas that are still to be seen in many of the remains uh, that are around uh, the countryside. Even the popes in the past appreciated the therapeutic properties of the local hot spring. And this is one of the advantage of living in a volcanic area that you have an abundance of hot springs. The beautiful countryside just outside Viterbo is dotted with many thermal pools just in the nature, as you see it here. And these water, besides having uh, different terapeutical properties, uh, are also incredibly warm and relaxing. So since uh, the Roman times, uh, uh, these healing waters have been enjoyed by soldiers, uh, princes, uh, aristocrats, merchants, and still up to now, nowadays, locals still use this water. They still uh, take these baths at every time of the year, day and night. Um, Viterbo is uh, the presence of many natural hot springs in Viterbo makes this city a very famous uh, um, thermal tourist destination with some very beautiful hotels located in the area of the springs where you can enjoy spas, massage, medical treatments and so on. Um, Viterbo here you see the main monument of Viterbo, il Palazzo dei Papi. Uh, Viterbo is certainly the biggest and largest city in northern Lazio, and it is the capital province uh, which bears the same name, the province of Viterbo. The origins also date back to the Etruscan times, and the city started gaining importance in the 11th century. First as part of the papal state, then in uh, 1095 as a free comune. The development of the little Viterbio um, was favored by its strategic position along the Via Francigena uh, because thousands of pilgrims uh, were walking along this uh, road uh, uh, reaching uh, Rome. So hospitals, a new church, a hostel for pilgrims and the first section of the city were built during this period. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, in 1215, um, 1257, Pope Alexander IV, uh, threatened by the Ghibelline factions in Rome, uh, moved the Papal Curia to Viterbo. So from 
from Rome, Viterbo took the place of Rome, became capital city of the Vatican, and it stayed uh, the main, the, the head city of the Vatican for the following 24 years. There is a very fun fact relating to those times uh, apparently after the pope of uh, the death of the pope clement the uh, in 1268 um, 1268 uh, 18 cardinals uh, gathered in viterbo in order to elect a new pope as usual as they found themselves uh, constantly fighting uh, uh, in profound disagreement uh, because of their political and nationalistic divisions uh, the cardinal, they couldn't come to an agreement. And the decision of uh, the, the process of the decision making was extremely slow. So much that after 1006 days, which makes it almost three years of arguing inside this palace, the population of Viterbo lost its patience and decided to lock the cardinals uh, in the great hall of the papal palace. Ever since, uh, this is known as conclave, cum uh, clavis, cum clavis with the key. So literally it is locked in. Uh, despite being locked in the palace, uh, the cardinal still couldn't find a solution. And at a certain point, the magistrate had to uh, remove a piece of the roof and reduce the, the food supply. So basically, when this cardinal got really hungry, finally, the new pope was elected. So, but it wasn't easy. Uh, here you see um, a portion of uh, the medieval district of San Pellegrino in Viterbo. San Pellegrino is really the largest and best preserved medieval city center in Europe. Uh, and it is lovely to walk and roam around these beautiful couple streets, little alleys and quaint squares. Um, it is the most popular quarter of Viterbo uh, and it dates back uh, roughly to the 1200s. This is a very usual architectural element of San Pellegrino. Uh, this staircase is called the Proferlo. Il Proferlo is something that you can see only in Viterbo and in some of the neighboring cities, but it is very special of the city. Um, these are external staircases that used to connect the downstairs of the old houses uh, where people kept uh, their animals or used them as uh, uh, work Shops to the upstairs where the ancient Viterbesi uh, used to live. Something uh, that we are very proud of here in this province and that has made Viterbo also very famous all over the world is La Macchina di Santa Rosa. La, La Macchina di Santa Rosa is a, a machine 98 feet high built to honor Saint Rose, which is also, who is also the patron saint of the city of Viterbo. The machine processions is a very significant event in Viterbo. The whole community again lines up in the street, as you see in this picture, to attend uh, the procession. Uh, and, and is included in the UNESCO representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. Every year in the evening of September the 3rd, uh, 100 men called Facchini, porters, the porters of Santa Rosa, hoist the machine, which weighs about 11,000 pounds, and carry the machine throughout the very narrow streets of the old town of Viterbo uh, for a route that is roughly one mile long. The machine is rebuilt anew every five years. The Facchini, they wear uh, a white uniform with a red sash tied at their waist and a headdress covered in leather. To be selected to be a uh, Facchino is considered one of the greatest honor, but it is, the selection, as you can imagine, is really, is really strict. You need to pass uh, several tests, uh, the most important of which is, is a test of strength. Uh, you're supposed to carry 
uh, at least 150 kilograms uh, on your shoulders uh, uh, for at least 100 meters uh, without uh, stopping. Before setting uh, out, uh, the Facchini receive a blessing from the bishop at nine o'clock. They start uh, carrying the five ton machina along the streets of Viterbo. For most of the route, uh, the Facchini walk uh, without any visual aid, only directed by the voice of the capo Facchini, the leader of the Facchini, uh, and uh, guides posted at the four corners of the machine. Now, here I've got a video. I'm sorry, I, I made it with my phone last year, so the quality is not really high, but I really want to share it with you to give you, share with you somehow the thrill and the excitement of Basically, the porters, uh, row by row, they will get, uh, yeah, they will get under the machine and at the shouting, sollevate fermi, lift and still, they will lift up the machine, which will disappear in the narrow streets uh, of uh, Viterbo. Let's see if the video works. I hope so. <laughs> Uh, I think this is uh, really spectacular. It's not easy to attend this event because uh, it is so crowded that you need to go and take a, your spot on, on the streets like hours before otherwise there is no possibility of uh, of uh, finding a place on these little narrow streets but it's really worth it once in in a lifetime is really worth seeing this um here just outside viterbo a few miles away of viterbo we find these marvelous gardens uh, it's called villa lante and it's located in the small city of bagnaia so this is by no means the biggest or the most uh, spectacular of all the great gardens that we have in Italy, but for many, including King Charles of Britain, who has had the honor of sleeping here, uh, this is the quintessential Renaissance formal garden, also called the Giardino all'Italiana. Um, the, the Villa Lante um, has set indeed the pattern for many imitations replicated in fine houses and estates across the world ever since. Dating back uh, uh, the mid 1500s, uh, the hillside position enabled the engineer uh, Ginucci to create also spectacular water uh, garden. Uh, its original creator was indeed Cardinal Gambara, but it took nearly 30 years to complete uh, the gardens and the buildings uh, as we see them today. So during the late Renaissance, uh, gardens uh, became larger and even more symmetrical and were filled with fountains, statues, grottos, water organs, uh, and other features designed to uh, please, to delight the owner of the mansion and to amuse and impress uh, the visitors. So if you were impressed by the pictures of Villa Lante, wait until you see the next gardens I'm about to show you, the so-called Park of Monsters in Bomarzo, called also the Sacred Wood. This is, uh, Bomarzo is about 20 minutes driving uh, from Viterbo. The name Park of Monsters was given because of the presence of the grotesque uh, sculptures uh, scattered in this uh, surreal uh, landscape. This is really a unique uh, place uh, and it is also the oldest uh, sculpture park in the modern world. 
Pier Francesco Orsini, who was the Lord of Bomarzo uh, at the time, built it and completed it by 1552. He had the rocks sculpted on the spot, animating them, uh, giving them forms of uh, sometimes threatening or persuasive or dreamlike sculptures. Prince Orsini who was also known as Vicino, had just been through uh, a brutal war, uh, had his friend killed, had been held for ransom for years, and come, uh, came home only to have his wife die. So wracked with grief, the prince wanted to create a shocking uh, villa of wonders, and he hired the architect Piero Ligorio to help him to do so. Ligorio was a very widely uh, respected and famous architect who had just completed the Church of San Peter in Rome after the death of Michelangelo, as well as the Villa d'Este in Tivoli. And he was happy to, to carry out uh, this uh, uh, commission. Uh, the Park of Monsters differs from other Italian gardens. Uh, um, and while fitting into uh, an architectural naturalistic culture of the second half of the 16th century, it really is a unicorn. It gives life to a labyrinth of silence, allusions, and also illusions. Uh, numerous studies have been made uh, to somehow reveal the enigma of this grove, uh, but the Garden of Bomarzo is probably destined to remain a place uh, steeped in, in mystery somehow. The park is filled uh, with uh, bizarre and fascinating uh, sculptures, and there are only some inscriptions here and there that trying to give a lead or an explanation to what you're looking at. Probably the most scary of them all is the giant mouth that you've seen at the opening. And the, the writings that it's there says, uh, all reason departs. So it's somehow a way of saying, this is something you can try to understand it, but it's, it's not supposed to be understood probably or something like that. Um, this is a very interesting picture. On the right hand side of the picture, you see the famous painter Salvador Dali, uh, who being a surrealist, he fell immediately in love with the gardens of Bomarzo, so much that he shot a short film here. And also the gardens inspired uh, the painting of Dali, The Temptation of St. Anthony, which he painted in 1946. Um, on the left-hand side of the of this slide, you see how the park looked like uh, in the first half of the 20th century. It was in a complete state of abandon, but luckily now it has been restored and made accessible to visitors. Uh, now I'm going to randomly show you, although there is so many more things that I am not able at the time to show you, but I will just quickly show you some pictures of nearby cities and sites that you can visit in La Duscia. One of them is this beautiful amphitheater, the Roman amphitheater dating back the first century uh, AD, and it's called the, the Ferento Amphitheater. Imagine that we still host uh, um, performances, ballet, concerts in this Roman amphitheater in summertime. Another impressive Roman amphitheater is located in the city of Sutri, uh, which uh, is, stands on the Via Cassia, which is the main ancient Roman road that connects uh, Viterbo to Rome. Um, and this uh, amphitheater was discovered in the 18th century. Close to Sutri, in the city of Caprarola, you find the beautiful Palazzo Farnese, which is considered one of the best examples of Renaissance mansion. It dates back to the 16th century, and it was initially conceived as a fortified mansion. Therefore, you see the pentagonal plan, uh, it was soon then transformed into an imposing residence for Cardinal Alexander the Younger. 
Inside, you will see these beautiful masterpieces uh, painted by the greatest artists and architects uh, of the time. Um, attached uh, to Villa Farnese, there are the gardens, which is also a splendid example of late Renaissance garden. In this picture, I'm showing you the Castello Orsini, located in the small city of Soriano, which was built at the beginning of the 13th century. Uh, in 1871, the castle had been modified to become a prison that didn't last too long. It was then again abandoned and nowadays is privately owned. Another castle, uh, Monte Calvello, also in the province of Viterbo, dates back, this castle dates back to the 8th century during uh, the Longobard invasion of uh, La Tuscia. In 1970, this castle was purchased by the very famous painter Baltus, uh, who was also the director of the French Academy of Rome uh, in Villa Medici, um, who has used this castle as a private residence until his death leaving it then to his son, Sash Klosowski de Roland, that you see in this picture. You can follow, if you wish, the adventure of this castle of Monte Galvello and of the owner, Sash, on TikTok. Uh, again, not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, I was reading an article on The Guardian who was talking about Stash, who was also a friend of mine. I happen to know him as a very... It was super interesting and dear person. Uh, and he was quoting this crazy life uh, of uh, Stash being friends with uh, Paul McCartney, Rolling Stones, and all this crazy, you know, uh, and fun, uh, fun life of Stash. And he has become a TikTok uh, influencer at the age of 81. So if you want to know more about Stash, uh, there you go. And if you're lucky enough visiting the castle of Monte Caldello, sometimes Stash uh, himself leads uh, the tours, Prince Stash. Uh, another impressive naturalistic site in the surroundings is the Fageta dei Monticimini. This, um, this woods is listed again in the UNESCO World Heritage Beach Forest. It is thought as a sacred wood that had existed here since the Bronze Age. Uh, the, the trees uh, are, are 250 years old and they go up to 150 feet high uh, and featuring a diameter of more than three feet. This is the wonderful city of Vito Orchiano. It's a small medieval village, and due to its location, it's called the Hanging Hamlet. Uh, the ancient village of Vito Orchiano is leaning on a huge peperino blocks, and it is entirely made of peperino, which is this volcanic origin rock, very dark, black color, which is typical of the area. And I love to show you this wonderful, uh, drawing is uh, this wonderful print made by the Dutch artist uh, Maurits Cornelius Escher, who painted a view of the city while he was living there. And now it is time to leave the hills of Tusha and drive towards the coast, uh, towards the Tyrrhenian coast, uh, where we will also meet the landscape of Maremma. And I believe that the idea of cross point of, uh, of these two cultural heritages of Tusha and Maremma is exactly my town. <laughs> it's called the famous Tuscania, which by now, you know, it is not. Tuscany, but it's another place. Um, for me, this is, uh, honestly speaking, <laughs> the most beautiful place on the planet. <laughs> Uh, the historic uh, center of Tuscania was uh, currently it stands on an area that has been populated since uh, very ancient times. 
on the hill of San Pietro uh, that you see in this video, a village dating back the ninth century before Christ was found. The whole territory was then occupied for a long period by the Etruscans, and between the second century and the first century BC, then the Romans arrived and village, the village became a municipium with the name Tuscana. After the fall of the Roman Empire, Tuscania became part of the Longobard Kingdom. Oops. The Golden Age of Tuscania goes from the 4th uh, to the 3rd century before Christ, when the city uh, began to form around the hill of St. Peter and the Rivellino Castle. In the medieval times, because of the battles between Guelphs and Ghibellines, numerous castles were built in the area. But in the 1300s, uh, because of the Black Plague that decimated the population of almost uh, all central Italy, Tuscania became also depopulated and turned into a modest uh, center of the papal state. In the 16th and 17th century, during a period of relatively peace, uh, wealth came back uh, uh, to the town and some other more imposing palaces were built in the city center. This is a picture of an event that we have organized in the Basilica of St. Peter. There was, was a living nativity that we, uh, we had set in the Basilica together with my dad. Of course, I have to speak about my family, otherwise I would not be a real Italian, right? Uh, the Church of San Pietro stands on this hill that has got the same name, uh, and the hill was probably the site of an older Etrusca necropolis. The front of the church faces a grassy open space between the Palazzo dei Canonici and the towers that uh, surround uh, the church itself. Uh, the church is powerful, solid, but is also graciously ornate. Uh, it resembles uh, somehow a fortress. The facade is most prominent in the central part and includes a portal with this beautiful rose window that you see in the picture and is surrounded by a multitude of decorative elements and side entrances. The church as it stands today is the result of several interventions. Here you see the interior divided in three naves, uh, the central one decorated uh, with this incredible cosmatesque uh, mosaic on the floor. Inside the church, you also find the Etruscan sarcophagus uh, that ornate uh, the church itself. Similar to the ancient Egyptians, uh, Etruscans uh, seem to have conceived the uh, tombs uh, as homes uh, for their death. They carved out structures out of volcanic stone meant to last for eternity and filled them with their most valuable and precious belongings. The cathedral crypt has got nine aisles and it consists of 28 columns and it is constructed with the remains of Roman and early medieval buildings. So it's a great example of recycling. It is a place dedicated to the mysteries of death. The space is broken by these pillars and compressed by arches. It looks a little bit like a, like a forest. Of the years, in beautiful movies have been shot on this location. I'm gonna just name two. Uh, that you may also have watched. One is uh, Iotello directed and starring the great master of Orson Welles. And the other one is Romeo and Juliet directed by Franco Zeffirelli. We have another uh, Gothic, uh, Romanesque basilica in Tuscania, which is the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore, San Mary Major, uh, which, uh, which has got inside, beside the altar, a beautiful fresco um, featuring the Last uh, Judgment. And here you can see some, uh, some precious details of this wonderful fresco that dates back to the 14th century. Um, 
here in this, but this is actually a video. I'm going to play it uh, right now. Then I have to stand still because you're supposed to hear the sound of the video. Uh, but you can see uh, the Rivellino. So basically, when you are arriving in Tuscania, you will see on top of the hill the ruins of these castles that uh, welcome you. It was a fortified palace uh, divided into three main bodies. Now we only have a part <clears throat> of the external walls with the typical Ghibelline features, ornaments on the top. Um, on the on the slopes of this uh, of this hill of this castle lives an artist who um, works uh, with these very special instruments that he creates uh, that are called wind harps. Basically, they are instruments made of wood and nylon strings played only by the wind. And of course, the artist is my uncle Mario Ciccioli. As you see, it found a very strange, very mysterious, very mysterious environment. And they are played only naturally by the wind. So, no wind, no music. Another great art. So Tuscania is a place that has attracted uh, over the years uh, numerous artists uh, for, for the, the, the amazing energy that the place has itself. One of these uh, to whom I was really attached as a kid, uh, her name is Bonaria Manca. Bonaria was a shepherd. She, she came from Sardinia. She was born in 1925 and she moved to Tuscania when she, in 1956. Bonaria started painting in the 80s, so at the age of 60 years old, after her husband had abandoned her. Uh, so the solitude uh, where she was uh, living uh, made her feel that uh, it could have been an opportunity to discover some some talents of herself that she had never she didn't even know she had. And so she started painting out of nothing. She started painting and she started painting on the walls of her house, creating really incredible uh, works of art that later on were also discovered by critics and other artists that also helped her to organize exhibition and interviews. Also, they shot a short uh, movie about her. I remember going to the house of Bonaria that you see in the picture as a little girl with my mother who loved going there. And for me, it was like entering in another dimension. The only thing I didn't like is that I didn't understand why I wasn't supposed to draw on the walls as Bonaria did. So that was a little bit disappointing. Here we see the fountains of Le Sette Cannelle. The fountains was already known into the Etruscan and Roman times, and it is uh, it has got the typical Gothic uh, style with the coat of arms of the financiers uh, of the construction of the fountain itself uh, on the front. Uh, close to Le Sette Cannelle, we arrive to this beautiful park, Parco Torre di Lavello from uh, this uh, beautiful promenade uh, to, uh, at the foot of Torre di Lavello, you can see these magnificent uh, views on the basilicas of San Pietro e Santa Maria Maggiore perched in the horizon on these uh, solitary hills. So this is the park. We shot this images during the pandemic. <laughs> so as you can see, there is nobody around. I mean, it's true that it's off the beaten path, but not like this normally. There is people around, but not in these videos because it was the time of, of the lockdown. Um, this is now the main cathedral of the town, the Duomo. Uh, and this is the um, this square that hosts um, many beautiful palaces built uh, during the 14th and 15th. 
actually to Scania has got also somehow a tragic history because in 1971, a huge earthquake uh, really destroyed 60% of the old town. 22 people died during the earthquake and 5,000 people were left uh, homeless. It was in that even what well, this is 6th of February 1971, and the community was all excited for the opening of the new theater. So all the people was about to go attend the celebrations uh, when the earthquake came, and the new theater uh, immediately became a refuge for the injured and the homeless people. The, um, the interesting thing, the good thing about uh, what has happened in 1971 was that Tuscania today is a great example of uh, a sort of enlightened restoration work, an amazing restoration work that was carried out by the engineers and was Otello Testaguta. He basically built the old town following the original medieval plan. So after the earthquake, uh, uh, two decades later, Scania came back uh, to the beautiful city that it used to be before this very tragic event. And here you can see, you can hear the birds. We often have these groups of birds flying around the valley, which is very, very impressive. Something that I think it's worth mentioning for, for you is that in town we also have um, a university, a study abroad university for North American students, which is called the Lorenzo de Medici, which is this building that you see built uh, um, along the city walls, uh, where students uh, from uh, US and Canada can come and spend a semester abroad. So before we move to the next uh, city uh, on the on the coast, uh, one last glimpse uh, from the fountain of the Belgian building. Again, sounds of the water and birds are the sounds that you hear more often in the city center. And now we are, we are. <laughs> and now we are in Tarquinia. So Tarquinia is this um high, it was the highest uh, urban development center during the Etruscan time. Uh, the golden moment of Tarquinia was the sixth century BC. Uh, Tarquinia was very predominant uh, all around the area, and the power extended uh, even to Lake Bolsena, just to make you understand how powerful the city was. Um, the, the, the main site of Tarquinia is undoubtedly the Etruscan necropoly. The Etruscan necropolis is uh, uh, the most important necropolis of the Mediterranean. It contains about 6,000 uh, burials and it dates back to the 7th century BC. Of course, the Etruscan necropolis of Tarquinia is also part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, since 2004. Um, some of the paintings and the sculptures that have been found in the tombs uh, are now kept in the beautiful archaeological museum of Tarquinia, which is considered one of the most important uh, museums in Italy for Etruscan art, together with the Villa Giulia Etruscan Museum uh, in Rome. Uh, this is the beautiful and very famous sculpture called uh, Winged Horses, a sculpture sculpture made of terracotta uh, is a um, high relief uh, slab dating back to the 4th century BC that was found in the Ara della Regina. But uh, what is the most famous feature of Tarquinia are these uh, painted Etruscan necropolis. The painted tombs of Tarquinia are not only 
the most significant collection of Etruscan figurative art, but uh, also the beginning of wall painting in Europe. Tarquinia represents the largest art gallery of the pre-Roman world. And for this reason, the city has been called the city of paintings. Here you see the tomb of the leopards uh, with the famous banquet scenes uh, that include musicians and dancers. These paintings, uh, these frescoes, they reveal something about this civilization of which, again, I repeat, we really don't know much. We don't don't understand their writings because they didn't use the Latin alphabet. We don't know exactly where they came from. Uh, somebody imagines uh, Turkey or Egypt, uh, uh, somewhere around the Mediterranean. We know that they were sailors because they were painting these uh, sailing scenes. Uh, but uh, the, the very special thing about the Etruscans is that all that we know about them is all the evidences that we have found in their necropolis. I don't know if you know what exactly necropolis means. It, it's a, the, it is a Greek word composed of two words, necros, that means death, and polis, uh, that means cities. So necropoli is the city of the death. Again, because the Etruscans believed in the afterlife. For the Etruscans, there were two parallel life, the life when you were alive and the life that you would have had after your death. So the conception of their cemeteries, uh, it was just the same as conceiving uh, a city. So in these burial sites, uh, we not only we find the paintings, but we also find the objects that the Etruscans were using in their daily life. Therefore, we can somehow reconstruct uh, in our minds uh, their civilization. For example, in these scenes, uh, something very important is revealed to us. We see the presence of women. Uh, the role of women in, in the Etruscan society was a uh, privilege once, uh, at least uh, <laughs> one for one time. Uh, differently from the Greeks and the Romans, where women were not allowed to participate, for instance, in festivities or banquets or this kind of events, uh, we always see the Etruscan women participated to this kind of events. So that shows <clears throat> that the Etruscan women had an important uh, role in the society. Also very present in the scenes depicted in the necropolis are um, scenes about music, uh, dancing, uh, and so on, that reveal this connection of, uh, of the Etruscans uh, with also some of the gods coming from the Greek culture, such as Dionysus, the god of wine, but also the god of rebirth. Uh, moving out, oh, I'm sorry, moving out uh, the necropolis, uh, we find uh, on the coast, uh, we find uh, the um, saline, the salt works. Uh, here you have a beautiful pictures of the salt works with the flamingos coming by usually in the fall. Um, and they, and they, the salt works played an important role already since the uh, Etruscan and Roman times. The activity of salt extracting stopped in 1987 in the area, uh, which has been designated as a natural reserve managed by the University of Tuscia in Viterbo. Something very funny and curious about this is that in this area, if you come here, you will notice that we eat a very special bread, which is made without salt. Uh, the legend, according to the legend, we eat bread without salt because at a given point, the Pope had raised the salt taxes and was asking for more money to the people to pay for the salt. And we were stubborn enough to say, guess what? You keep your salt and we make bread without salt. So I don't know if this uh, is this a real story or just a legend? But the fact that we are very stubborn is definitely a fact. And also we eat bread without salt. 
Nearby Tarquinia, there is another impressive archaeological site, which are the ruins of Vulci. Vulci was a very important town in the ancient times, which is about 10 miles away from the sea, between the village of Canino and Montalto di Castro. The site was excavated in 1956, and extensive cemeteries and large network of streets and walls were found. Um, some of the most important objects found in the tombs of Ulci are kept in some of the most famous museums around the world, such as the Louvre in Paris or the British Museum. This is a wall painting that was found in the, uh, one of the tombs of Ulci named La Tomba di Françoise, after its discoverer, and this uh, wall painting was taken away from its original location and is now kept in the Museum of Villa in Rome. Here I'm just showing you quickly some of the objects uh, in terracotta and ceramics uh, that were made uh, during the Etruscan times, where you can see how sophisticated and elegant uh, uh, and refined was the technique of working uh, the ceramics uh, among the Etruscans. This is an object that is kept at the British Museum and these are the jewels. Also, Etruscan jewelry is probably one of the finest, the most beautiful um, art that they uh, that they had um, because they were very clever in the production of pottery, but also in the work of uh, metals such as bronze and gold. Uh, here we see the castle of Ulci. The castle nowadays hosts the archaeological museum. Uh, the, Abadi, the manor of Abadia, which rises between Vulci and Canino, was erected to control uh, the so-called Devil Bridge or Rainbow Bridge. The bridge was built in the 3rd century BC during the Etruscan Roman rule of, uh, uh, of the town. Now, we move a little bit uh, around the city of Vulci and we reach the countryside of Canino. Canino is really famous for the production of uh, the extra virgin olive oil. The oil has been considered DOP, which means the origine protetta. Uh, of protected origin, and it's got this denomination since 1996. Uh, it is really hard to get this recognition of Italy. So this is uh, for sure a um, uh, uh, sign <laughs> that the olive oil that is produced here is very good. And also the presence of uh, uh, olive trees that are hundreds of years old, uh, it's an evidence to the fact that the art of olive oil making is very remote in this area. Uh, it's now, what is it, October, almost November, and it's time for us to harvest the olive. This is my favorite time of the year. This is a short movie that we shot uh, with our friends uh, uh, harvesting the olive trees. You can see, basically, you have to put these nets all around the tree. Then you have to shake the branches uh, manually or with a stick uh, or with these more modern uh, uh, machines. The olives, they fall on the net, uh, then you gather them and then you bring them to the meal. Um, it's, it's quite hard to make good olive oil because there are several factors that have to match uh, in order to have a good quality. Uh, first of all, you have to know when is the the right moment to choose uh, the degree of ripeness of the olives. Here you see my other uncle <laughs> looking the olives one by one, <laughs> almost, uh, because the ripeness of the fruit uh, uh, impacts also the taste uh, of the olive oil that you will produce. Uh, so you have to monitor the ripeness on a daily basis in order to plan ahead the harvesting and the processing. The first stage of extraction of the ext uh, um, extraction is crushing, uh, is the crushing process, which is a mechanical process uh, made uh, 
uh, that, that, that needs to break the tissues of the olive and the pit to produce the olive paste. Uh, I'm going to play this. The olive paste then is mixed in a steel tank uh, with slowly rotating blades, enabling the separation of the oil from the rest of the paste. After the extraction, the oil undergoes a process of clarification um, and it can either be filtered or simply left to settle. Depends on your taste. Some people like it filtered, some others don't like it filtered. Uh, very important is the storage of the olive oil because if you keep it uh, at the direct sunlight, this can affect uh, the qualities and the properties of the oil. So you should always keep the olive oil in a dry, um, shadowed uh, cupboard. Um, olive oil, uh, uh, you probably, I don't know if you know, but olive oil is a very healthy food. Uh, it has got the same quantity of omega-6 of the breast milk. It's very high in monosaturated fats, uh, and it's also loaded with antioxidant, uh, some of which have really uh, powerful health benefits. Uh, around Canino, we also have this beautiful uh, property. Uh, it's a tree house. It's actually several of them built around, uh, built in the middle of these beautiful lavender fields. And we celebrate uh, in late June, beginning of July, also La Festa della Lavanda, the Lavender Feast, where our region turns a little bit like Provence in France. And now I'm very pleased to introduce you now. We are almost at the end of the tour. Uh, before we say goodbye, I want to introduce you to these very special people. It's the, our version of the cowboys. We call them butteri. Uh, the butteri are uh, probably the, the most significant uh, example and symbol of the territory that we call Maremma. La Maremma is the coastal area of Western Central Italy, bordering the Iranian Sea, including Southwestern Tuscany and some parts of Northern Lazio. Um, it was formerly a marshland, often malarial, but it was uh, drained. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, like uh, their American counterparts, uh, <clears throat> La Maremma has got its very charming uh, rugged horseback riding cowboys um, that, uh, that still work uh, the land as they used to uh, in their tradition. Uh, they are extremely connected with the land that they inhabited and the animals that they uh, take care of. Uh, I am going to show you now a short uh, movie filmed by my husband, who I own actually most of the images of that I'm using on this tour. So, grazie, Thomas. Enjoy this short video. So yes, like this, you can have uh, an idea of uh, our cowboys, our butteri. You might recognize this guy. This is Buffalo Bill. And Buffalo Bill, in 1890, he brought his show, Wild West show, in Naples and proceeded to Rome as part of his European tour to offer the world an authentic uh, wild frontier experience and showcase the American cowboy skills. During this time, Buffalo Bill met a prince named Honorato Caetani, and the two of them started talking, and they ended up 
up uh, in a bet, in a sfida, um, with uh, betting on who of the two had the best uh, uh, horsemen. So in March uh, 1890, during the Wild West show, they carried out this bet, uh, Buffalo Bills with the American Cowboys and the Buttery, in the countryside around uh, Rome. Now, this is the trouble. According to the Italian version, the Butteri uh, defeated uh, Buffalo Bill and the Cowboys because they were superior in riding skills. Uh, according to, ah, and, and also they say, not only they won, but they also say that Buffalo Bill ran away not paying the debt of the bet, which was at the time 1,000 lira, so it was a lot of money. On the other side, the American historians insist that it was, of course, the Americans who won the bet because the Italian riders failed to tame their horses in a reasonable, reasonable amount of time. Uh, therefore, Buffalo Bill and his ensemble were the great winners. So the story, the challenge between Buffalo Bill and the Buttery, it's legendary here. Of course, we insist that we really want that. And you actually should give us that money back as soon as possible because we need it too. No, I'm joking. But I mean, we insist that we want, but this is just to say that this the story of Buffalo Bill is for us really, really important to our pride, let's say. Uh, yes, so in Maremma, we also find this amazing spot. Probably you have seen it because I see pictures of Sodurnia, they are getting more and more popular. Uh, you always see it like this in the picture, but actually you never see it like this in reality because it's always very crowded of people. Still is very, very beautiful. Uh, Saturnia is the name that the Romans gave to this uh, waterfall. It's a hot spring, it's hot water. Uh, but there is this incredible waterfall creating all these natural pools on the, on the slopes of the hills. Uh, according to the legend, the name Saturnia comes after the Roman god Saturn, the god of peace and renewal. Uh, the legend says that once Saturn disillusioned with man's kind endless wars, sent a thunderbolt down to earth creating an enchanted hot spring that would bring uh, uh, peace uh, to any who bathed in its waters. Wish that was true, really. And now before we say goodbye, uh, our last secret of this tour, the Tarot Garden. Um, if you have been to Paris and if you have been to the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art, the Centre Pompidou, outside the museum, the right hand side, there is a small square with a very crazy modern fountain. Uh, with these very bright colors. That fountain and these gardens are made by the same French-American artist, uh, Niki de Sanfol. This garden is called the Tarot Garden, is located in Capalbio, in Maremma, along the coast, on a hill. And it is inspired by the tarots, by the 22 arcana of the tarot cards. And it was realized by Nikki Sanfol uh, herself uh, within a time frame of 17 years. The artist was inspired by um, the gardens of uh, Barcelona, the Parc Gaudí in Barcelona, but also from the gardens of Bomarzo, which by now you know what uh, what it is. Um, she used uh, these uh, the, 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 the cards that these sculptures have uh, a steel soul covered with uh, concrete, uh, with mirrors, uh, colored glasses and pieces of ceramic. It's all a huge mosaic. These sculptures are huge. You can walk inside them and actually the artist herself has lived inside of one of these structures for long years. She created the gardens together with her um, artist and husband, Jeanne Tingli. So 
this is our last uh, last uh, gem <laughs> i really hope uh, you have enjoyed uh, this tour i'm really thankful i'm really happy that i had the opportunity to share with you uh, the places of my of my art maybe some of you have gotten some inspirations for new travels and whenever you like to shine away uh, for you welcomes with open arms thank you oh that was amazing I think I have another place on my bucket list right now <laughs> uh, we've been talking about me going over and over and over again but now it really has to happen um, <laughs> so I, I want to thank you for bringing this region to us and uh, as well as um, so many of the viewers have have given you thanks on the chat and in the Q&A do you have some time left in you to do some questions do you mind if I read of some course. questions to you awesome of course I just put up a slide. Um, this is a way to tip Yane. You could do it through Venmo, PayPal, or there's a credit card link on my website. Um, any of those ways, the tips will go to Yane minus the Zoom operating expenses, but um, rest of the tips go right to the guide. Uh, I also just listed our physical tours that are coming up. So if you're interested in joining our group on any of the physical tours, please um, reach out to me. This tour is being recorded and it will be up by the end of the night on the website and the YouTube videos. So um, you can watch it if you didn't get a full chance to watch it or share it with some friends because it was so great. Okay, let's dive into the Q&A. So the first one, I want to go all the way back to the beginning because I think it's easier um, to go furthest to newest. But um, so one that was very interesting to me is um, uh, one of our viewers says that she's read a lot about the Etruscan women, namely Takia. Um, what do you think of these women and what are your thoughts specifically, if you have any? So I don't know exactly this woman she's um, mentioning, Takia, but I I'm also quite passionate about this subject because indeed uh, it is a very um, it is a very different way the Etruscans involved women in their in their life. Of course, uh, they did. It was still it, it was not a mat matriarchal society. I can mm -hmm. say that in English. It was still a patriarchal society, but but women were part of it, and they were also um, not only allowed, but they had uh, roles uh, inside uh, inside uh, uh, the families, but also in the organization of the society itself. Uh, and I think uh, I think uh, that the Romans have ruined it all. They conquered us. <laughs> we are still upset with these Romans. No, I'm joking, but I mean. It, it is true, the Romans absorbed, let's put it that way, the Etruscan society, which was really different, though. It, was, it wasn't like, the, you know, the same happened with the Greeks. But we know much more about the Greeks than what we know about the Etruscans, because we don't have much left about the Etruscans. And also, we can't read their documents, even the few documents that we have left on stone, we can't read it because we don't know their alphabets. So... We assume the, for instance, relating to the role of women, the importance of women also in the tombs that we have found. Uh, we have found also many amazing jewels uh, and, and also objects that women were using in their in their daily life. So we assume that women had uh, a privileged role in this society, but we don't really know much more. At least uh, I, I'm not that expert that I know more, but I mean, this is more or less uh, mm -hmm. the story of the Etruscan women. I have a follow-up on that, not so much about the women, but a, a sense of the identification of the Etruscans. When do you think, or or how did that transition from the Etruscans to the Italians? And do you in the Etruscan areas still identify as Etruscans versus Italians? How, how does that work? It was. It has been. Uh, it has been a sort of a slow assimilation of the Etruscans into the new Roman society. Um, actually, um, one of the first uh, seven kings of Rome was Etruscan, had Etruscan origins. So that is also a sign that the Etruscans weren't just, you know. Uh, 
erased uh, from, from their existence. They have been assimilated into the, into the Roman culture. But the Roman culture was really different. The Romans were, were soldiers. Uh, they were basically warriors and they were aiming at fighting and conquering and enlarging and expanding. They were also clever architects. They were really clever engineers. But in terms of culture, philosophy, music, uh, um, uh, religion, all these things, uh, Romans uh, at the beginning were real barbarians. They didn't have much. Uh, later on, they will put into their culture all these suggestions from the Etruscans and from the Greeks and from all the others' population that they were slowly absorbing into their empire. The truth is also that Italy, you know, Italy, you say the, the difference between Etruscans and Italians, Italy didn't exist uh, as a nation since uh, 1861. So the only one time in the history, the whole territory of Italy was ruled uh, by one entity. It was during the time of the Roman Empire. Then after the fall of the Roman Empire, everybody came to Italy, the Goths, the the Normans, the Arabs, the Turkish, and so on. And from there, the Spanish, and from there, you know, our very complicated and long history has started and creating also all these subdivisions within Italians. In Italy, we still struggle to call ourselves Italians. I mean, we are Italians when we go abroad because we miss our mother and our cooking. But once we are in Italy, we are all... Uh, Romans, uh, Napolitans, uh, Sicilians, Sardinians, and so on, because we do have very different heritage and history. This area where I live, um, uh, politically is Lazio, belongs to the region of Lazio, but we feel here, like we are only one hour away from Rome, but we don't like to be called Romans because we identify ourselves and our culture with the Etruscans because we have Etruscan, I have Etruscan tombs in my garden. <laughs> not that I have digged them myself. They were digged already. They are not actually mine. They are owned by the government. They happen to be in my garden. So we, we are constantly in touch with this cultural heritage. And for us is the Etruscan cultural heritage. And there is an area which isn't political because then we have been divided politically, but there is an area which encompasses southern Tuscany, a part of Umbria and northern Lazio, which used to be the Etruscan area, which is still nowadays, after more than 2000 years, uh, has got many things in common from the food uh, to the, to the li dialects that we speak, uh, to the products that we make. For example, the pottery. If you go to Orvieto, which is in Umbria, or you come here, you go to Tarquinia, you will still find artisans working the handmade pottery in the way the Etruscans used to do it uh, more than 2,000 years ago. So I don't know if I have answered your questions, Mara. I yep. You mentioned the food. Much. Is there any real differences other than the salt and the bread between what we would consider to be Italian cuisine and Etruscan cuisine? Mm, no, it, uh, Etruscan cuisine, uh, it's more, we don't call it Etruscan cuisine because we don't know exactly what the Etruscans, probably they had olive oil already, but we don't know exactly what the Etruscan ate. But I mean, we are pretty much like Tuscany. So we, we do eat, uh, for instance, a lot of uh, wild boar, uh, legumes, uh, uh, of course, olive oil, uh, wine, and so on. But yeah, it's very similar to the food you would eat uh, in Tuscany, generally speaking. A few questions that are specific about the presentation. Um, where, What was the name of the town with the very gorgeous cathedral that you showed with the hand, with the, um, the painted ceiling and the self-portraits? Si, orvie Orvieto. Orvieto. Do you want to type Orvieto it? So it's a very famous sound. Orvieto is on the is really mm, easy to reach when you drive from Florence to Rome. It's in between Florence and Rome on the highway. If you look out on top of the hills, you see this beautiful 
hilltop village and you also see the skyline of the cathedral because it's majestic, the facade is enormous. And Orvieto is probably of all the places that I've mentioned is the, the one that is best known, I would okay. say is more touristy, even though nothing compared to Venice or Florence, but it's more, much well known than all the others. The houses that are in the Etrusc Etruscan cities, do they date back to to before to BC or I mean, is there anything still no. there or is it just ruins? The cave, we have caves, uh, the, the mm -hmm. grottos, the ca caves that date back to that time. Uh, we don't have, uh, we only have ruins. We only, only have stones of the, of the villages dating back to Etruscan times. What we mostly have more intact uh, are the, tombs and the cemeteries because those were digged right inside the, the in rocks. your yard <laughs> in my yard right yeah sometimes <laughs> my chicken go there but yeah I you... try to explain <laughs> that they're not allowed to go they <laughs> there's they... probably a little connection there that they have that we don't even know about let's they do a trust can eggs right I have a Etruscan eggs made in the grotto. <laughs> you you showed a wall painting where there was a sitting young man with a knife at his neck. Do you remember that uh, picture that you showed? The question yes. is, what is the story behind that with the knife but, at the young man's neck? But the story, I... I, I I when I was looking at the painting, it's a bit like Pompeii. You know, when you go, if you've been to Pompeii and you go to the red light district there and you see all these crazy souvenirs outside Pompeii. I mean, the Etruscans had uh, also in the wall paintings, they show everything of their daily life, including uh, scenes uh, that for us are <laughs> somehow difficult to understand or they you know we don't act like that anymore but you know it, it was these banquets uh, celebrating uh, uh, the god of you know with wine and so on and they also show the effects of the music the ecstatic dances uh, the orgies uh, you see all of these things uh, in the the sacrifices you see all of these things in the world painting in Turquina. Yeah. The um the man you showed with the olives that you called your uncle. Is it truly your uncle? It's my uncle. Yes, <laughs> of course. Federico. <laughs> He's a character. You can go if you survive, you can try and help him out with the olives, but no, <laughs> none of us want to do that because but he's crazy. There's more questions about what happens to the olives. Do they go to waste or are they all no no? So the okay. olives, uh, they they get all in these nets, uh, and then from the nets they get in these like buckets, uh, yeah, cases, uh, and then on the same day, not the day after, because it's like a fruit, you know. If you have a rotten apple, yes, you have to do a it basket fast. of apples. They all go rotten. So yeah. when they are, when they when you want to have a very good quality olive oil, I'm not saying that they, everywhere they do the same, but Theoretically, if you want a very good quality oil, you have to bring the olive on the same day. And also, right. theoretically, the mills, uh, sometimes they check, they put their hands in the baskets to feel if the olives are too old. Because if the olives are old and rotten, the olive oil gets uh, high in acidity and then the taste is not so good anymore. Um, the big machine that was carried through the streets that you showed the video of, yeah. what's the significance of that ceremony? It's, uh, it's you know, the origin is medieval. Uh, we have many in each Italian city, probably even in most of it in smaller towns, you have these uh, ceremonies that have... Uh, uh, religious roots uh, and uh, most of them include uh, parades so this is a parade many religious ceremonies especially the ones dedicated to Mary the Virgin uh, or to other female characters uh, they have these parades where they carry a, a small chart with the statue of the saint 
in Viterbo, they decided to go big. big <laughs> so, really big, really big. Even in the rest of Italy, we have, you know, eight people carrying a statue. In Viterbo, we have 100 men carrying a, a skyscraper. Yeah. Uh, this is basically what, what happened there. And then at the very top of the machine, there is always the statue of the saint, uh, Santa right. Rosa. In the machine, every five years, there is a contest for architects that want to participate in creating uh, the new machine because every five years, they create a new one. And this is very prestigious to, oh, to I'm sure. be the architect that, that designs the machine. Uh, we'll wrap it up with one last question about us all going now to your region. How expensive is it relative to Italy in general? I mean, do is it because it's off the beaten path? Are there better prices for hotels and and um, to travel there in general? Allora, I would I would, I would say yes. Uh, although I don't feel like saying that it's very cheap compared to this and that. Um, I would say that there is more, there is, it's easier here to find local restaurants, uh, local shops. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not spoiled by tourism. So it's easier to find, uh, you know, fresher products or home handmade things and all of that. Uh, it is also true that the, the area is not so unknown to Italian tourists. So we do right. have uh, a sort of local Italian tourists uh, like weekends and so on. But we have uh, lots of B&Bs. We have several hotels. Some of them are really prestigious. The one I showed you in the lavender fields, you have to book it uh, six months ahead or something like that. It's all over, the, you know, the... The, the reviews and mm -hmm. documentaries and newspapers also abroad. Uh, and there are other locations that uh, you, you can find a little bit of range of, of everything. But of course, you don't have the same amount of structures that you will have in Rome or in Venice or in Florence. So it can get pretty pa packed yes. pretty soon you know, because... Yeah. And in terms of prices, you find a range of prices. You can find uh, cheap accommodation, especially in B&Bs or three stars hotels. Uh, it's, it's certainly more affordable than, than the Amalfi Coast or Capri right, or sure. Venice. So, yes, for sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Yane. I am so happy to thank see you, you again. I appreciate you bringing your love of your place to us. And I know that um, we're, we've just now killed it because we're all going to want to go there. And then it's not the best kept secret anymore. But thank you so much and have a good night. I know it's late for you. So um, enjoy your rest. And I know everybody else here says thank you to you as well. Take yes, I see. I, I'm reading you. I want to say thank you to Mara. Grazie. It's always wonderful. And it's always great. You're such a, you look ahead. I don't know how to say. You're so open-minded that you immediately took the challenge of this tour, which I know it's so, so not easy to promote since it's not so not well known. And I want to say thank you and ciao to all these wonderful people writing messages. And uh, I hope to see you again soon. Uh, and all see you in Italy, all. maybe next next spring. Va bene. I'm here. All right. See Tell you. me before. If I'm not on tour, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> Take too care. Bye-bye. Grazie, Mara. Bye. Ciao.